Oh, shame is the prison, as cruel as the grave. Shame is the robber, and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the crowd. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. Oh, shame is the prison. Oh, fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant, he's always telling me to run. But a love is a resurrection, and love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my
the Lord mighty in battle. Because Jesus is alive, he is here with us now, able to hear every prayer and heal every heart. Because Jesus is alive, we know his promises are true. And one day he will keep his promise to return and claim his bride as his own. If Jesus were still in the tomb, our story would end in the grave. But he got up. The grave could not hold him and death could not defeat him. Our Messiah is alive. And because he is alive, we will live with him again forever. That is why we sing, he is alive. Hallelujah. Alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb.
Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I am so excited to welcome you to join in that declaration from generation upon generation of Jesus followers on this day that he is no longer in the grave. He is risen. Amen. It's a privilege to welcome you and to worship here at Grace Point, whether you're joining us online or here in the room. I was thinking about, it was a year ago, we weren't able to gather like this. And how thankful I am that we're able to gather and exalt the name of Jesus. Amen? This morning, we want to encourage you to participate however you feel comfortable. That means if they're singing and you want to join in, it's not a solo just for them. You join in and sing along. If you don't know the words, make up your own words. Uh, th they'll love that. They do that sometimes. I've seen them do it. It's okay. We'll just join in and exalt Jesus together. If, if you're seated and you want to stand, then stand. If everybody's standing and you want to seat, have a seat, that's okay. Our focus is not on someone up here or on the person to the left or right. Our focus is on Jesus. Amen? In fact, would you pray with me? Let's welcome the most important person here today. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we exalt you. You are worthy of all praise. And so, Lord, we declare with our own mouth that you are our risen Lord. And I thank you for the hope that we have in you today. Jesus, would you help us? We don't want to just get through an Easter service or an Easter weekend, Lord. Would you captivate us? We want to be gotten by you, gripped by you in the strength and the hope in the good news gospel message you give to us today. So, Lord, there's been preparation for this day. There's been anticipation for this day. But we lay it at your feet, and we say all this is for you. We give you first billing. Amen and amen. I want to encourage you, uh, regular attenders, to join with us in your faithfulness and giving of God's tithes and your offerings and faith promise gifts for missions. Uh, as you remember, we're not passing the plate at this time, but you can give online or on the church app or at the exits as you leave today. You can give there if you'd like to. If you're new with us today, if you're visiting or a guest, we did not expect that you came prepared to give. Feel free to take a pass. Uh, but for our regular tenors, we want to encourage you to know how to give if you'd like to do that today. Church, would you stand with me? And let's participate together. Let's exalt the name of Jesus in song. Let's do that now.
God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance you do not stay angry forever but delight to show mercy yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you therefore he will rise up and show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice blessed are all who wait for him Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he gives us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more
the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many Yeah. 
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Speak. 
I speak the name of Jesus over my family. I speak the name of Jesus because there is peace. There is peace beyond what we could ever find on our own because we serve a God who is a loving God and a God who cares for us and a God who wants to speak his peace into our lives this morning. You know, we have come through uh, what would some would say is a difficult year. <laughs> we've faced many challenges, yes. We've faced uh, and we've been exposed to the, the decay of our moral fabric and our society. We've faced daily challenges in regards to our health, in regards to our finances, our safety, our families. But here's what the Lord says. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? The Spirit of the Lord declares to those who are faithful, do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed, for the battle is not yours, but it is God's. When God calls us to action, when God calls us to move, the power of success is in his hands. Right. It's, it's not in ours. <laughs> Let us be encouraged today, for God gives us the strength that we need to face each day's battle. Never will, no, you never will, you never lost the battle, never lost the battle. 
Lord, I thank you that all things are possible in you. Apart from you, we can do nothing, but with you, Lord, all things are possible. Lord, I pray that you would help us hear from you today the word that you have planned for us for a time such as this. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you have a Bible with you or a phone that's got the Bible downloaded on it, uh, if you would navigate to John chapter 3, we'll be there in just a second. I want to share with you today uh, the simple gospel good news truth. Simple in that it's laser focused and clear from God's word, not frivolous or easy or flippant, but potent and powerfully clear and simple, we find in John chapter 3. This God who can do all things, he's never lost a battle, sounds like a pretty good God to have on your side. Jesus, you can do all things. You've never lost a battle. You have a perfect winning streak. I could use some of that. Let's get some Jesus in my corner because I have some agenda I want to accomplish. And so let's welcome that Jesus in. I don't know for sure, but I think, I think that as we read John chapter 3, we find a pretty good guy who finds some use for Jesus in his life. Could it be that this good guy that we're going to look at, that he said, Jesus, there's something different about you. I, I could use some of you in my life because I've got some things I want to accomplish. How about you come bring that power to do what I want you to do? In John chapter 3, we find what might be the most famous scripture in all the Bible, John three sixteen. You may have heard it. You may have this scripture memorized. You may have taught it to your kids or your grandkids or to someone else around you. And when we hear John three sixteen, sometimes we're tempted to think, oh, that is a 101 beginner's basic scripture. I'm on to the deep things. I don't know that I need to hear about this, but I believe the Lord has a fresh and new breath for us in this scripture. What we find here in John chapter 3 is that in the middle of a the night, there was this man named Nicodemus who came to find Jesus. He wanted to talk to Jesus. 
Now, in the middle of the night, that's interesting to me. Was it because he didn't want the ridicule of others in the religious camp to come back on him because they weren't so keen on Jesus? Was it because it was what was convenient for him? The scripture doesn't tell us exactly why. But what we do see is Jesus is there, and Jesus is ready to have a conversation with Nicodemus. What that tells me is Nicodemus thought he picked the day and time, but Jesus had a divine appointment for him. He had a time set, he had a meeting place set, and he had a word to give to him. In essence, he says, Jesus, the things that you do, the things that you have done, it's obvious that you came from God. You have come from him, and, and, and only one who comes from God could do these things. He's saying, Jesus, I'm a good guy. I like you. And then Jesus has the audacity to respond to these kind words to say, unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. He begins to say things that Nicodemus doesn't quite understand. Now, to help us catch this, we need to know a little bit about who this man Nicodemus is. He's not only just a guy with a kind of a different name, uh, but he's a guy that while you may not recognize his name, you'll definitely recognize his type. I want you to think with me about Mother Teresa or maybe Billy Graham. If you don't know those two names, think about the person that you know or you've heard about that is the best person, the most honest person, that has done the most good. They are the most innocent, the most sincere. You think about that person, Nicodemus would fit in the category. See, Nicodemus, he was a professionally moral person. His job was to do good things and to teach people about good things. He had tremendous education. Not only did he have education, he had favor with his community. People respected him. He had a good reputation. And by comparison, it wouldn't be that hard to see that he was maybe better than a lot of people, if not most people. And so we hear that Nicodemus, one of the good guys, one of the guys who says, Jesus, I'm kind of into what you're doing, to hear that he can have no part of the kingdom of heaven unless he hears what Jesus is talking about being born again, enters in the reality for really good people. Here's the reality for really good people. It's that they have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not because I say so, but that's what your Bible says in Romans 3, 23. Every single one of us has sinned or fallen short of God's standard. And that sin separates us from God. I kind of imagine it like this. Uh, in high school, or actually junior high and early high school, I ran track. I wasn't very good, but I ran track, and they put me in the long jump area. I guess for guys who can't run very well, they say just run a few feet and then jump and land in the sand. Maybe, well, that's what we'll do with him. Uh, but in the long jump, I did better than other people on the team, and so I got a spot to do the long jump at the track meet. And and actually one year, I think it was in eighth grade, I set a record for the long jump. And it stood for about a year until someone else came and did a better job than I did. I could tell you that I'm a record-setting long jumper, but the fact of the matter is it just depends on who's in the room. But if you would line all of us up on the edge of the Grand Canyon and we would see the chasm from one lip of the canyon to the other lip of the canyon and we'd say, you know what, let's take a running leap and see if we can get to the other side. I doubt you would be thinking, well, how good of a long jumper are you? Can you jump farther than me? Could I jump farther than you? Because it doesn't take much to assess and say the edge of this canyon to the other edge of the canyon, it's too far of a gap. Now, there may be some who are better at long jumping than others. I may run, and I may out jump you by at least, I don't know, 15 yards or something. I don't know. I'm not that good. But I would fall right to the pit of that Grand Canyon. You may out jump me and, and go even farther, but you'd go right to the pit. The Olympic record holder for the long jump could line up and come to the edge of the Grand Canyon and take a running leap and jump 
And sure enough, he would definitely go farther than you and me, but he's not going to make it to the other side. And so it's a moot point on how good of a long jumper he is. The chasm is too big. This is what Jesus is describing in different words. Sin separates us from God, and it doesn't matter how good you are, how respected you are, how much you like me, Jesus would say, that you want me on your team to do good things and and to win every battle for your agenda. That's not going to bridge this chasm. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. While there is an all-encompassing aspect in that truth, there is the good news that is made possible through what we celebrate at Easter and John 3.16. The scripture simply says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. You may have heard that scripture before. Even if you haven't heard that scripture before, I'm confident God wants us to not miss the deep truth in this scripture. So let's just take a couple moments and go piece by piece, part by part, Why is John 3.16 so good? Why is it what Jesus says to Nicodemus in the middle of the night, a divine appointment? Why is it the hope that we have at Easter? Why is it that we celebrate what we see here in John 3.16? The first part is this, for God so loved. I love this. Friend, regardless of what you believe, regardless of what you think, regardless of what you agree to, you have been created by God Almighty. In the beginning was God, and God created the heavens and the earth, and God created you, he created me. And so before we ever come to this sin issue, there is a God who has created you, and it is a God who loves you. Somebody needs to hear today that your God loves you before you ever even acknowledged him. God loves you, and it's out of his love for you when he created you, because your creator is the one who spoke you into existence, he knows how you could live the best life. He's not a cosmic killjoy trying to pull the rug out from underneath you or trying to to crouch in on what you have gathered and earned and try to mess up your life. He says, no, I have given you life. I want you to have the best life possible, and it all starts with this God, for God So loved, starting with his love. That's the origin of this redeeming love. To be redeemed, to be saved, sometimes we go, "Uh, I'm good. I mean, someone else may need to be saved. I mean, they're they're pretty bad, but I'm I'm good. Be redeemed, to be bought back, to be purchased back. Someone else may need that, but, but I'm good. I'm in a high moment of my life. Hold on. Remember who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the professionally good guy. He's talking to Nicodemus, one whose name could be put there with Mother Teresa or Billy Graham or or the person you know that is the best person you can find. He was a pretty good guy, but yet God said, I have something you need, Nicodemus. Listen to my son. For God so loved the world. We next see the object of the redeeming love. God so loved the world. The world. See, God chose to love his creation in man and woman that he created, even in the midst when you and I rejected him. His creation that he loved said, God, no thanks. We're going to do what we want over what you want. You know, that's what sin is. It's not some arbitrary set of rules that's archaic and that's no longer applicable today. It's anything that God says, this is what is best for you. And you say, God, I know what you say. I want what I want over what you want. James 4, 17 tells us anyone who knows the good that he or she ought to do what God says and they choose not to do it. God, I want to do my way over your way. God loved that world. You and I are in that world. Not because we deserve it, not because we've been cleaned up and we're prettied up, because we are wonderful things. No, because he loves us and in the middle of our rebellion, he so loved the world. Not only are we the object of his love, look at the next part. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Don't miss this. This may be my favorite part of this scripture. It's the gift of redeeming love. 
God is the one doing the giving. You know, Satan, he's not creative. He can just take what God makes and twist it. And he takes the truth and twists it and gets you and me to hear God wants something from you. He wants to take your money. He wants to take your fun. He wants to take your plans. He wants to take your dreams. And he wants to crush them. That's the voice of Satan. You know, God doesn't want to take something from you. He has something for you. And he says, I have the best life possible for you. And so Nicodemus, a professionally good guy, one who seemed to have it all together and life was going well, for God, his creator, so loved him, even when he didn't really feel like he needed him, he gave his one and only son for Nicodemus, for Billy Graham, for Mother Teresa, for you and for me. You see... He didn't just give anything, he gave his son. We talked about this on Good Friday. Jesus died on the cross. Why did he have to die? If he's the one who's never lost a battle, why did he have to die? Because sin, when we do things our way, not God's way, it leads to death every time. Because God's way is life. He is the creator of life. His way brings life. When we choose our way or another way, we are saying no to life and yes to death. And so Jesus, paying the price for our choices to do our thing our way, which ends in death, died. And he not only defeated death, the grave, and hell, he conquered sin, and he resurrected, and he can offer life to us. For God so loved the world that he's the one who gave his one and only son, Jesus, could do what you and I cannot do. He could bridge that Grand Canyon. He is the one who lays his life down and we can get to the other side to be in relationship with God because of Jesus, not because of what we've done, our reputation, how good we are, how smart we are, how woke we are, how in touch we are, how caring we are, how compassionate we are. None of those things bridge the chasm. It's only because of Jesus. We see the next part that whosoever believes in him. We see the condition of this redeeming love. Oh, I knew it, Brady. I knew there was a catch. It sounded too good to be true. This is a conditional thing. Hold on before you get too excited. Well, here's the condition. God's way is life. And God loves you so much, if you or I are set on rejecting life and we insist on embracing death, God is not going to force life on you or on me. And so God says, the only condition is lay down the death and let me give you life. If you and I are drowning in the ocean and the life preserver is sent out to us and the Coast Guard says grab on to the life preserver and you go, how rude. The saving help is there. I need to receive it. The condition, whosoever, anyone not based off your pedigree, not based off your actions, not based off your education, not based off your church background, anyone who would believe on him, believe in him. Now, this is more than just a mental agreement. We know that the the demons believe that Jesus exists. They know that Jesus exists, but they don't trust on him. They don't put their weight on him. So to believe in Jesus is to trust him enough to obey him. Now, that next part's not popular. That next part, the editors want to take out of a book. The next part, they say, just, you just divide the room. God loves, and because he loves, he wants you to do whatever you want to do. That's not really love. That's, I don't know, taking your hands and throwing it up and saying, I don't care. It's sometimes the very opposite of love. Because God loves you, he says, I know what's best for you, and I want you to love me, trust me enough to do what I'm telling you. Because he has your best interest at heart. What's the purpose of all of this? It's the end. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Why? What's the purpose that you and I could experience life and eternity with him, but life here and now. He's come to give life and life to the full. You will not experience or see the kingdom of God until you are born again in heaven and here. So I want you to remember who Jesus is talking to. 
He's talking to the good guy. He's talking to the guy who said, hey, you know what? I'm coming in the middle of the night. Not everybody thinks you're so great. I'm kind of into you, Jesus. I could see how you winning every battle is going to really help me out. I want to join team Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I need to be your everything. I'm not here as some kind of add-on to your portfolio, some... uh, a good luck charm, some lucky rabbit's foot that you a little bit of the devil away so you can go about your plans. Jesus died on the cross to not only give us freedom, but it's not just freedom to do what I want, but freedom that I could stop choosing death and freedom by the power of the Spirit of God that rose Jesus from the grave, freedom to choose life every single day. Jesus, talking to somebody who was pretty good, highlighted how they fell into the pit of the Grand Canyon of sin every time. Maybe you hear this today and you say, well, I thought I was pretty good, but now I'm not so sure. Hey, friend, all of us have sinned and fallen short. Maybe you're here today and you hear this and you say, I would never say I'm good. I'm pretty bad. Good news for you. All of us fall into the pit of sin. There's no one who is good enough. There's no one who is bad enough. Jesus says, I am here. Whosoever will believe in me, I will give them life. Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I think in a room like this, there may be a lot of you who have already prayed a prayer like I'm going to pray and accepted Jesus. And the temptation that we think is, oh, that's for somebody else. That's for that other person in the room. But if Jesus had a divine appointment for Nicodemus in the middle of the night, Do you think maybe he might have a divine appointment for you and for me on Easter Sunday to grip our hearts again and remind us that when we only want to speak Jesus is the reason why, because I have life in Jesus, my hope this Easter is not that I see the tail end of COVID-19 going down. My hope this Easter is not in my skill set. My hope this Easter is not in my good works. My hope this Easter is not in my agenda. My hope this Easter has to be in Jesus and Jesus alone. And I think the Lord wants to remind us that this freedom he gives to us is not just a one and done thing that just gets us a ticket to get out of hell free card, but to choose life in him every day. So as I pray, I want you to pray silently with me. Maybe you're here today and some of this feels a little bit new to you. Or maybe you say, you know, there's things that I've said and I've done that are wrong. And if what you're saying is true, Brady, if that's what the Bible says, then those things separate me from God and I don't want to live like that. There's hope for you, and as we pray, Jesus wants to allow Easter to be real for you this year. Would you pray with me? Father God, I know there's things that I have said and that I have done that are wrong. And I know those things separate me from you. Jesus, I want to ask you to forgive me of my wrongdoing, my sin. And I'm not just sorry, but Lord, with your help, I want to allow my sorrow to turn to repentance. And I don't think I can do it, but with your help, would you help me choose your way, not my way from here on out? And Lord, it feels almost too good to be true, but if you're giving me this redeeming love, I receive the lifeline today from you. I receive the gift of salvation in you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, or you prayed again, remembering when you have prayed that to the Lord, I need to remind you of what Luke chapter 15 verse 10 says. All of heaven celebrates when one man or woman repents and comes to Jesus. 
And so I want to invite you on this Easter Sunday to do what heaven is doing right now. The angels are celebrating as you declare your repentance. What's that? I'm turning away from my way, and I'm choosing your way, Jesus. Not because I'm so good or I've got it all pulled together, but because of who he is. There is a cosmic celebration. There is hope. Lift your head, church. There is hope in Jesus. Let's sing it together. Let the past be dead and gone. Come on, saints and sinners, you can't outrun God. Whatever you've done can't overcome the power of the blood. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the world start crumbling, let the gates of glory open. Yeah. 
Church, we have reason to celebrate, amen? The reason we got to speak Jesus over our family, over our neighborhood, over our city is because he is our hope. There's hope in no one else other than him, amen? amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand with me, but don't leave yet. There's one more song, but stand with me because the Jesus who walked out of the grave, the same power who rose Jesus from the dead is the same power in you and gives you life this Easter. Let's sing this song together. Don't leave yet. Let's sing, He Walked Out.